Welcome to Melbourne, Australia, often considered the arse end of the world. You might think it's the last place on earth for innovation, but per capita we are one of the fastest adopters of new technology, and Bitcoin is no exception. Early in 2014, mainstream media led the world to believe that Bitcoin had collapsed, when in fact it was only the fall of a single exchange. The price bounced back within days. Now that's an event that is unprecedented in the financial world. But the same media outlets didn't want to run that side of the story. So we thought we'd balance the scales and give you the opportunity to make up your own mind. This three-part mini-series will introduce you to some of our innovators, our startups and merchants, our visionaries, and will share with you tales of success and the tales of loss. Bitcoin is basically the future of everything. I'm not talking money, I'm talking everything. There's always going to be the early adopters that are there right at the start. And I think in 20 years time, we're going to look back and think, how could we have actually dealt with physical cash? Bitcoin itself was, was worth zero for eight months after it started, and then it gained a value. And, uh, and why it has that value? Well, it's one of those questions people ask when they first get into it. Because the first reaction is always like, what is that? And then you're like, oh, it's a Bitcoin machine. And they get so excited. They're like, really? That's a thing now? Yeah, it has no borders. The end game could be that it's an accepted worldwide currency. One of the reasons Bitcoin is attracting such attention is because it's owned by the participants. There is no governing body and it's available to everyone, regardless of your credit history or geolocation. Bitcoin stems from a platform where people openly collaborate sharing ideas to develop solutions to complex issues, the results of which are then free for anyone to use or further develop. Quite naturally, from this mentality, people started talking about creating virtual currencies, now known as cryptocurrencies. E-gold and Digicash were two such attempts. However, their centralised nature meant they were easy targets for governments to shut down. In 2009, a mysterious entity known as Satoshi Nakamoto published a white paper to an online community of cryptographers. Security experts and hackers went through the paper looking for weaknesses. Instead, they collectively decided it was bulletproof. In 2010, WikiLeaks made headlines when their accounts were frozen. Under pressure and in the spotlight, they announced they would start accepting Bitcoin. Knowing the code was in its infancy, Satoshi responded with, WikiLeaks has kicked the hornet's nest and the swarm is headed towards us. Shortly afterwards, the lead developer Gavin Andresen told Satoshi he was going to a meeting with the CIA. Satoshi disappeared, gone without a trace. What was left behind has rocked the world in five short years. Its story has been driven by a passionate community of people from the ground up. We're living in an age where the speed of innovation is critical. Environments that encourage people to collaborate and act quickly on ideas are gaining momentum. This is happening in physical spaces as well as the online world. Welcome to the world of the co-working space. This is Inspire9, a uh, co-working space here in Melbourne where many startups uh, get their first shot at uh, collaboration with other people and uh, working in an environment really unlike uh, traditional office spaces. You find a lot of resources in other designers, uh, developers and even business people who are willing to help out and give input into whatever project you're working on. Some really good startups like Adioso, Rome to Rio, Uber were based out of Inspire9 as well. So uh, it's a great place for people to tap into the resources of the local startup community. Well, it's a hell of a, of a ride, to be honest. The amount of people that we managed to help along the way, that's really a big part of my life. We're not doing it for anything else besides our passion. Same like people do project on us for their own passion. So it's a great experience for me. I would, if I go back, you know, three and a half years ago, 
I would do it again, but I, I probably take half a year break before I start. <laughs> Uh, there's a really big global trend going around of how uh, the, the cost of operating startups has really dropped uh, and the support networks are really growing around it. Uh, Silicon Valley obviously has a great thing going for it, but our goal is really to bring a little piece of that over here, you know, innovate and, and build world-class companies out of Melbourne. So for people who have been going crazy working from home alone, uh, the, coming to a co-working space is like a breath of fresh air. And for people who are working at the moment, um, this is a great alternative to a you know, larger corporation or a, a big business where maybe the culture is a bit stale. We do believe in doing business you know, for good. So people, planet, profit. It's also known as the triple bottom line. Essentially what that means is you can never make um, any business decisions or financial decisions based on profit alone. Um, you do have to take into consideration the people and the planet as well. So while co-working spaces are ideal networking environments to build and create businesses, a cryptocurrency is created by a global network of computers that communicate via the internet. This setup is known as mining, and the people who run them are called miners. George from The Hub explains. Um, your, your developers, your software programmers, anybody who deals with systems and numbers, but when they create a network, it will be a network that um, is made or built so that it doesn't need people as much. Right? It can run without people. Um, but at the same time, it's the people that created those systems. Uh, the Bitcoin mining community, um, the miners, um, their form of expression in terms of networking is through the systems and the numbers. Uh, first computer I ever built. Um, that was doing well for about a month and realized, okay, shit, this might be profitable build our second. So they're 7970s. Uh, they're running Windows. And now I have, um, I can probably take this off. These are the big ones now. So they're 290Xs and they're hashing it around 880, 890 each using Ubuntu. We didn't use heating once last year. So they actually heated the entire land room and kitchen. And there was times where we had to open every window in the middle of winter because it was actually too hot. So they, uh, they did a good job. I've, I've worked out that the concrete um, is basically a big heat sink and it extracts cold air off the bottom and I've pumped cold air to the top and then I've got an extractor here which pumps to the roof. So sustainability. So this Bitcoin network checks and verifies all transactions to make sure they're legitimate and they're not duplicated. Each miner is rewarded for its speed and accuracy. All the transactions are kept on a public ledger called the blockchain. It's like a giant bank statement that shows every transaction ever made. It also stores the Bitcoin. Anyone can watch it grow in real time and explore its past. To access the blockchain, you need a wallet. This lets you send and receive Bitcoin. A Bitcoin wallet is a bunch of private keys that are used to sign transactions on the Bitcoin network. So they just look like a bunch of long numbers. There are about as many private keys possible as there are atoms in the known universe. So we're talking about like one with 77 zeros after a different number of private keys. The private keys, are, they're pretty much just that. You have to keep them secret because if anybody gets access to your private keys, then they can spend your bitcoins. Your QR code good, sir? <laughs> Uh, there are different kinds of wallets. There are hot wallets, cold wallets, there's online, offline, hardware, software, all kinds. Essentially a Bitcoin wallet is just a, a collection of your private keys, just like you would have a key ring. If it's printed on a piece of paper, it's usually uh, called a paper wallet. 
and all that is is you have your private keys and your Bitcoin addresses just printed out onto a piece of paper, usually with a QR code. If you're clever, you can hack all the funds on that. <laughs> is it full of money? Find out. So you can then store that somewhere securely, uh, and at any time you can then scan that back in um, to an online wallet and spend the funds. So you can compare a, a cold wallet to a safety deposit box, whereas a, um, an online Bitcoin client is just sort of like a, using a bank account. You would use a thin wallet just in sort of everyday use. Um, you wouldn't hold all of your Bitcoins on that, just as you wouldn't hold all of your money in your wallet. You would just carry a small amount of Bitcoins around um, on, on a thin client, maybe on your mobile phone. This is the most convenient way. So say you had your bitcoins on your phone and you're ready to spend, where would you go? Well, there are many shops, cafes, services and online stores who accept bitcoin. If you thought it was just for computer geeks, think again. My name is Jenny. Um, this is my little store called Veritan, and it's an eclectic little shop. It contains pretty much stuff, as you can see, mm -hmm, but mostly pretty things that I see fit to stock. <laughs> These little things here were the first product that Veritan ever sold to someone who purchased with bitcoins and since then I have renamed these products to Bitbunny. <laughs> Our system's also geared up to print up that the receipt to say that you have paid in bitcoin instead of credit or cash or miscellaneous. My name's Gary Passfield, I'm the licensee of the Old Fitzroy Hotel in Woolloomooloo, New South Wales. Um, and I've been here for 15 years and I accept Bitcoin. It will be rare that we don't get somebody inquiring about it weekly. It's amazing the exposure we're getting out of it. It's quicker than an FPOS transaction. Yes, you do need a tablet but that's your only outlay. Everything is simple from there. Then, a little bit of white Belgian chocolate. Go on top. <laughs> Make it look good. Oh, that is so thick. So people who do come to Sydney from all over the world and want to pay Bitcoin, they check out. Oh, where can I pay Bitcoin? Oh, the outhouse. All right. It's about letting people have another mean of payment. Why do we need the Australian dollars, the American dollars, the euros, the rubles, whatever it is? Uh, for me, it does go back to um, imagine all the people living life in peace, you know, imagine no countries. How they pay for it? It's fine with me. Bitcoin, cash, gold rings, whatever. Apparently the ATO says that it's a commodity, the Bitcoin now. It's not a currency. I don't know how many times I have to accept the currency, you have to use the currency until the people at the ATO will agree that it's a currency. But, you know, eventually it will happen. <laughs> So Tamar is building the flux capacitor at the moment. <laughs> Don't laugh, that sounds cool. <laughs>
Well, my name is David Brim. I'm CEO and co-founder of Tomcar Australia, and here we are in the manufacturing facility of Tomcar in Melbourne. Tomcar is a rough, ready, hardcore machine that you can fix it yourself. And we are peer-to-peer. -peer. We speak directly with our end user. And we name every change after a customer. So there's a sheep station in uh, Western Victoria who wanted an extra grab handle on the driver's side. So that's uh, Deborah and David Bain. So now we've named the grab bar the Bain bar. So you can order the Bain bar now. The high gearing is named after Peter Crombie who has a big uh, cattle station in Longreach. So the Crombie set for the gearbox and there's a number of other things like that. We came across Bitcoin uh, through the Melbourne community. I heard about it and we got interested and we looked into it and then we found out some of our suppliers take it. You know, we had a test with one of our suppliers, we bought some parts and we saved uh, some money internationally. So we, we've trialled it now with a number of suppliers and it works and we're still using it. And then we thought, you know, why not take it? Unlike large corporations who have dedicated finance departments, small businesses are often left in a frustrating world to fend for themselves. Even something simple like sending money overseas can take up valuable time and present large fees that nobody can account for. Uh, Latin America, for example, sending money to bank stairs fraught with robbery. I've even lost money, you know, where the bank said it didn't arrive. It's gone through a third party bank. It's gone through an American bank. Uh, to be sent to a bank in Guatemala, for example. You, you, you pretty much always lose 5% uh, if you're dealing with Australian or UK or American banks. I pay over $1,000 every single year between just tiny little frivolous bank fees. And given how much the banks make out of your personal accounts, my personal account, everybody else's credit accounts, there are fees, there are charges, there are interest rates, they make so much money already. They don't have to take any more, but they do. Still, every single day, every month, everybody gets billed. Whereas with Bitcoin, it's money within your hands. You have the power, you have the controlling share of exactly what you hold. And there is no need for banks to take a cut out of that. And they don't have to. Mm. I lose more money out of credit cards than I've ever, ever lost out of um, Bitcoin. And credit cards, people can walk in, and they regularly do walk in, present a credit card with ID, and uh, walk out without paying or doing the transaction. If they don't return to pick up their cards, we've lost that sale. And I've had sales that have been hundreds of dollars that they've walked out on. It's cheaper for them to get a new ID and a new card. Um, but as I said, there's absolutely no problem with Bitcoin. My name is Chris Tay, I'm a pastry chef. Um, this is my shop, Black Star Pastry. We had the first Bitcoin ATM in Sydney installed here about four months ago. Yeah, it's been great. Sixty staff in two shops now. You, you build a shop, okay, and that's going well. And at some point, you need to kind of think, well, what do I stand for? What is it all about? You go into this for a fairer system, you know. You go into this so you can send money to people who need it without having to go through one, two, or three different middle people. Um, when I get to the end of my life and I say, well, what really was important to me? What I want to say is that because of me, I was able to help a lot of people build their careers, build their families, all that stuff. That's what I want to do. Yeah. Family and future is something often mentioned when talking to people about Bitcoin. People who have studied the history of money and know the fragility of the current financial market often see Bitcoin as a safety net. 
okay, so we've you know brought these four children into the world, and we thought their future ought to have been pretty you know squared away, right? But now as they get older, I mean, my our, our daughter, our eldest daughter, is sixteen. You think, what you know? Okay, so so how's this going to work for her again? She's going to have to raise how much money before she can afford to um, you know follow mum and dad's footsteps? This is what happens when you create this huge lake of liquidity that is, that is roaring around the world, you know, desperately searching for yield at all costs. This is what you get, right? And the problem with that is, is that um, people can liquidate pretty damn quickly. Anyone who trades anything will know that you go up a stairway yeah, and you fall off a cliff. So here's this hugely complex over leveraged system I can't tell you, you know, when that might fall, and it could be something very insignificant, but it doesn't matter. We've baked that into the system, and when that liquidity is removed from the system, it will, go, it will take our breath away. Bitcoin is a natural response to, to, to that phenomenon, right? How do you protect yourself against that? When we had the housing crisis in the US, and, you know, and all these people just caught up in this machine, and just got spat out. And then all the people who were responsible for it are all getting huge payouts, you know, like these golden handshakes. I mean, like, there's obviously there's no justice. It seems so easy for, for people in power to, you know, just make income at the expense of, you know, people who aren't in that complex. Instead of us, like, just sitting there and taking it, we have to take matters in our own hands and, and do something that's, that's outside that whole sphere. You know, that's why I thought Bitcoin seemed like a really good idea. It's a, something that really takes the power away from the big banks and you know, big government and puts it in the hands of the people. Government regulation is a hot topic, especially when sensitive personal information is requested then filed away in a centralised system the public have no access to. Regulation often overcomplicates life, and many people are now looking for easier ways to transact quickly without bureaucracy. Take, for example, one of Australia's largest industries. So to know what a quantum leap forward Bitcoin is for the gambling industry, you have to consider what it's like gambling with government currency at the moment. This is in Australia, which is a gambling-friendly, well-regulated uh, jurisdiction. Uh, it will take at least 15 minutes to sign up and deposit with your credit card. Your credit card can then be charged at any time in the future. All the information you've given them, such as your email address and your postal address, that could be uh, stolen or sold at any time in the future. Then when you want to make a withdrawal, you will have to verify your ID by sending in a copy of your credit card, sending in the front and back of a government issued ID and sending in a utility bill. And then you'll have to wait two days for the withdrawal to come. Now, if you used Bitcoin, you can do all of that in less than two minutes, less time than it takes me to explain how long it takes to do it with government currency. And you'll also be able to bet anonymously. You might value your privacy from people you live with. You might be worried about tax implications. You might be worried about legal implications. So Bitcoin uh, can get around all of those problems. Gambling is just another thing that, that it makes easier. But it's a very popular thing, which is very difficult in, with government currency. There's a big question about the regulation of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. The whole point of cryptocurrencies is that they are designed to work transparently, without third-party intervention, government included. Bitcoin is unprecedented, as there is nothing in our history which compares. It's an intriguing topic and a great social experiment which is attracting some of the smartest minds in the world from all walks of life. I mean, Bitcoin is all about people, right? You know, this distributed, this huge wave of distributed sort of, you know, man, something's got to change, and you know, let's 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 do it. That's what we want to harness. 
you present people with such a no-brainer that they run out of reasons to say no. And I think if we can achieve that sort of groundswell of support by providing people with the tools that they need to make that difference, then th that would be huge. There's a lot of unbanked people in the world, people who don't have access to the world economy. They're pretty much shut out of a bank account. And because Bitcoin is as cheap and easy as sending an email, it's going to make a lot of difference to a lot of impoverished people who are unbanked or underbanked. And as long as people create value for it, which they will, it, it, you just can't kill it. You, it's, it's in too many places. It's everywhere. One thing about Bitcoin is that the rate of growth is most certainly faster than the internet was. Uh, people always say, so what should we expect? You know, how long is it going to take to get mainstream adoption? I say, how long do you think it's going to take for the internet to have mainstream adoption? It was in fact only seven years ago there were no smartphones because they hadn't been invented. So that required everyone to get a new phone, for pieces of hardware to be developed, to be distributed, to be sold in shops. Bitcoin doesn't require any of those things to grow into a um, commonly used thing. It's more like Twitter adoption or something like that. It just requires someone to poke their screen a little bit and, oh wow, now I've got a Bitcoin address. Well, I guess I can start accepting Bitcoin. Anyone want to sell some to me? Yeah, sure, I'll do that right now. Bam. Cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin bring absolute transparency to the table. The concept is starting to gain respect from skeptics and it's encouraging conversation about alternatives to our current archaic financial system. The study of nature shows that change is a constant, it's an evolution, and an integral part of our survival as a species. Our ideas are a reflection of this. We can either protect our ideas by locking them away, or we can set them free and test them against a changing world. This realisation is clearly apparent in the world of software where we have two models, proprietary and open source. A key way to find out which world you're in is to listen to the language of your environment. How much profit did we make this quarter? How could we make more? Hmm, we'll have to consult our legal department. Hey, quick, copyright that idea. How can we cut costs? So how can we make them buy more? What else can we sell them? With open source, people break technology to explore what else is possible, to make technology work faster and more efficiently, generally bypassing middlemen and making technology more compatible. The results are slowly making businesses pay attention. Think Android, which is now the most popular smartphone in the world. Language around open source projects could sound something like, If we share the foundations of this project, will it help other people in the future? Let's open up this project so others can contribute. If I wanted to send a dollar to Africa direct to that person, how could I do that? In the case of digital currency, people got together and asked, how can we create a digital money for everyone? As a result of this question, we now have Bitcoin. Bitcoin will, will solve some problems, but it won't solve every problem and it's not going to be solving democracy for us. It's quite a controversial thing to say, but I think Silk Road was probably one of the better things to happen for Bitcoin. From a legal perspective, um, a lot of the people in the legal industry I've been speaking to are fascinated because it's so rare that the law has to deal with issues like this. We live very much in a, in a society where there's a lot of controls put on us what you can and can't do or what you should and shouldn't do. Uh, Bitcoin sort of challenges that, that idea. I've hugged it as well. When it's not working, I'm often thinking, <laughs> yeah, I, said I, I give it hugs, thing. yeah. I give it hugs all the time. I'm like, hey buddy, how you doing? If you're a Bitcoin innovator and you feel like you've got something to contribute or you'd like to collaborate, or if you're interested in sponsoring us, let's talk. Until then, see you round like a Dogecoin. <laughs>